As dangerous as this world can be, we still manage to venture forward to live fulfilled existences, or at least existences that don't harm others. While nothing is guaranteed, we press on in the face of uncertainty. As such, the members of the Cam family departed the morning of September 28th, 2000, from their home in Georgetown, Indiana. David went to work and was planning on playing basketball afterwards from 7 to 9. It was Thursday after all. He did it every week. While his wife took their two kids to school, then headed to her job, the Cam household was void of the loving family moments they shared. Likewise, as Dave drove home after playing basketball, up the private road sharing the same name as his grandfather, Lockhart, he wanted more of those moments. The idea of which shattered upon him discovering what was left of his family. Calling the authorities, dispatch recognized his voice. He'd worked for 10 years on the force, but this was different. This time, David was begging and pleading as a victim of a crime. It was the patriarch David Cam, a former Indiana State Trooper at this point, who protected and served for the better part of 10 years. The matriarch Kim Cam, a financial analyst who fell for David's charming demeanor and married him in 1989, and their two children, little seven-year-old Bradley and little five-year-old Jill. By all accounts, the Cam household seemed conducive to a successful family, yet it wasn't perfect. Nothing is. There would be an affair or a few. David just couldn't or wouldn't refrain from engaging with women, described as a collector, shortly abandoning the family for a mistress during Kim's pregnancy with Jill. Still, the breach trust gave way to reconciliation. The Cam family was whole again. Finally, David appreciated what he had, what he couldn't bear to lose, his precious family. By the year 2000, David enjoyed more time with Kim and his children. After leaving the Indiana State Troopers, securing a well-paid sales position at his uncle's home improvement business, United Dynamics. They were rebuilding through struggles and the light at the end of the tunnel brightened. Spending time with the loves of his life, Kim, Brad, and Jill encompassed his existence. Mentoring his kids through their little league games, playing pickup basketball every Thursday from 7 to 9 at his local church. This was the cycle David fell into, being a family man. Although, even such deeply rooted, wholesome desires fall victim to tragedy, illustrated by the blood spilled across his garage floor, which completely morphed his sense of reality. He'd seen this before. As a former ISP, the crimson hue of a crime scene was all too familiar. She was on the floor, her pants were removed. Blood with a clear liquid surrounding it pooled underneath her head. As he held her in his arms and yelled, Kim, Kim, it became apparent she was gone. The kids, he thought, leaping up to find his children. They were in the Bronco. Bradley draped over the back seat on the driver's side while little Jill slumped over in the back seat passenger side, her little head in her lap, her hair draped over her face, concealing a massive bullet wound. There was no time to think. Undeterred with disturbing the scene, David reached over Jill and grabbed Brad, who was still warm, and laid him next to Kim on top of a gray sweatshirt. After attempting CPR to no avail, and in an adrenalized state, David called the Indiana Police Department. He recognized Patrice's voice when she answered, and she his. Indiana State Police Radio, Patrice, can I help you? Patrice, it's Dave Cam. Let me talk to Postman right now. Okay, he's on another line. Right now, let me talk to Postman. Hold on. You're my only truth. Uh, Andrew, get yeah. this body out. 
David, they're on their way right now, okay? I got everybody coming. Listen, I'm gonna let you talk to Patrice while I, I get people coming. Across the street, I gotta get some help. Okay, David, do you, do you need an ambulance? Across my parents, do you need an ambulance? Get everybody out. I'm going. Do you need an ambulance? I gotta go. Dave, he hung up. What? Subsequently, bolting to his grandfather's home, who lived right across the street, his uncle Nelson, who served a 30-year career in law enforcement, was taking care of the senior. He desperately begged for Nelson's help with the grisly discovery. Yet, there was no amount of law enforcement experience that would prepare Nelson for the sight. Even less so, as he pulled David out of the crime scene, he was inconsolable, writhing on the floor in agony. There was nothing that could be done. The sound of sirens grew louder. The thoughts of the people David once called friends overshadowed the reality that these were some of the final moments he'd be a free man. Police recognized their old friend David. They also recognized what was left of his family was callous disregard for human life. You know we have to clear you first, one officer remarked. It was Sean Clemens, one of his closest friends leading the investigation. Stunning David with how direct and seemingly insensitive he sounded, his family was just murdered. Still, he understood it was just the process. Sean, just do it right, he retorted still trying to comprehend the totality of everything. They were recreating what could have happened out of every detail that told a part of a greater narrative. Another crime scene investigator, Jim Niemeyer, worked past cases with David. He knew him well. Yet, within less than five minutes on the scene, he'd already determined this was David Cam's doing. Although, majority of the time, the spouse is responsible, it's not always the case. Still, the looming cloud of suspicion was beginning to form around David. Then, a prosecutor by the name of Stan, Faith, arrived on the scene. He knew David, and David knew him. Their relationship was less than friendly, but they were professionals. Stan also knew, or at least thought, that the gravity of the triple murder, which shook Floyd County, called for help outside the Indiana law enforcement. A renowned blood spatter analyst named Rod Englert Rod had made a career from his prowess in analyzing blood spatter patterns and reconstructing crime scenes. Across 40 plus years, he'd perfected the craft, and this was a situation all too familiar. However, he wasn't available to visit right away, and instead sent his protege, Rob Stites. As if under the influence of authority bias, riding on the coattails of a beaming recommendation, Law enforcement gave Rob Stites free reign over the situation. Stites walked to the scene, noticing some key variables. Clear liquid surrounding Kim's blood, what looked like blood spatter on the door leading to the garage, bleach and a mop bucket in the sink located in the laundry room around the corner from the garage. Did David throw a water and bleach mixture over Kim's blood trying to clean the scene? Did high velocity blood spatter leave behind an outline silhouette of a man on the garage door? Sean Clemens certainly believed so, delegating the investigative process to the supposed blood spatter expert. These were some of the accusations David was now facing. Yet no fingerprints were taken, no DNA was tested. Inflated assumptions were driving in clear contradiction to scientific analysis. Even David's alibi witnesses weren't spoken to. Eleven men who played basketball with David that night. There was a clear timeline for both Dave and his family that was ignored. Regardless, detectives were tunneled vision on the subjective interpretations of Stites. He thought David annihilated his family. On the other hand, other key aspects of what was in the garage were strange. A gray Hanes sweatshirt, a fat palm print on the exterior of the Ford Bronco, Kim's shoes neatly atop the Bronco, and Kim's pants were removed. At least one of these clues gave way to a sexual motivation. Though Prosecutor Faith navigated the investigation away from these key details, relying solely on his own sense of assumption, the third-party investigators he inserted, and the protege, Rob Stites, they'd virtually solved the case. Now, they needed a motive. However, to David, the gray sweatshirt sounded alarms. He had never seen it in his life. Letters written on the back of the inside of the collar read, Backbone. David unknowingly laid young Bradley atop it when he took him out of the car, his blood seeping into the fabric from the bullet wound in his torso, a bullet wound that severed his spinal cord. 
If he didn't die instantaneously, he would have done so slowly from internal bleeding. Yet, investigators tried to connect the piece of clothing to David, asking, So you weren't wearing this when you came home from playing basketball? I'm telling you, I've never seen it before that day, David retorted. Along with a fat handprint left on the Bronco's exterior, the sweatshirt would serve as the foundation for David's defense. While the prosecution perpetually refused to follow up on the true significance of these findings, then there was the shirt David wore that night. Stites found eight blood droplets around the bottom left corner. They tested positive for Jill's blood. To him, it indicated back spatter from a high velocity force, like shooting your daughter in the head. A later autopsy on her revealed blunt force trauma to her genitals. Was she suffering abuse all along? Or did this happen at the time of the murder? To David, he wouldn't entertain ridiculous accusations. Still, it drove further suspicion for David Camp's claim that he didn't execute his wife, shoot his son, and leave a gaping hole in his little girl's head. The official affidavit submitted by Sean Clemens included signs of cleaning substance. David's shirt had high velocity back spatter. A neighbor recounted three gunshots between 9.15 and 9.30 p.m. Kim's blood had signs of cleaning substance. Amongst other observations, it was the basis for charging David. Three days later, on October 1st, 2000, they arrested him for the slaying of Kim, Brad, and Jill. David was now in a struggle for his life. The prosecution had a slew of details prepared to gut David. Testimonies of past adultery with various women, as well as the shocking discovery during Jill's autopsy, spearheaded a less than subtle smear campaign aimed to paint David as an adulterous, abusive murderer. In fact, the prosecution suggested David had an ongoing affair and killed his family because of it. To the jury, it served as the foundation for the rest of the trial. Combined with how Rod Englert, the renowned blood analyst, enthralled the courtroom with subjective science that he created and how he influenced much of what Sean Clemens reported, it became a battle of the experts. It was directly against the appropriate protocol science-based crime scene analysis. They added to their case by including phone records detailing a phone call made by David within his home at the time of the murders, determined by autopsies to be between 7 and 8 p.m. The sweatshirt labeled Backbone was ignored even though it retained DNA profiles from not only Bradley and Kim, but an unknown female and an unknown male. David's defense had given the DNA profiles to stand faith for testing hoping CODIS, Combined DNA Index System, would return a match. However, the prosecution contended the DNA wasn't in the system, so it lacked relevance. So the defense poked holes in the prosecution instead. Residue on the garage door thought to be blood tested positive for motor oil. The liquid surrounding Kim's blood was a natural chemical breakdown after coagulation began. The liquid was what's known as serum in the blood, not bleach. The phone call differed in reported time because of a glitch. Substantiated by a Verizon employee, the phone records, mistakenly, were an hour ahead. The neighbor reporting gunshots between 9.15 and 9.30 denied recounting these details to Detective Clemens. Finally, the theory of blowback on David's shirt, while consistent with high-velocity spatter, fell apart with the testimony of his defense analyst, Bart Epstein. Little tiny stains. Epstein believes the stains on David's t-shirt can look like high-velocity impact spatter to some people. But in this case, the number of blood stains could be as important as their size. Gunshot will produce hundreds of stains coming back. I've never seen, nor in testimony I believe the other experts for both prosecution and defense, they've never seen just seven small or eight small stains from a gunshot. I've never seen that. In other words, the shooting of his family would have produced significantly more blood spatter on his clothes, of which there was none. Moreover, there were 11 eyewitnesses that vouched on behalf of his presence at the basketball game. This was something the prosecution could not refute. Rather, they implicated him another way. He must have snuck away from the game, drove to his house, murdered, came back and no one noticed. They were falling apart on a logical basis. Yet bolstered by the emotional response towards Dave's infidelity and speculation of abusing his daughter, it compelled the jury, in direct opposition to his 11 witnesses, 
he was found guilty on March 17, 2002, sentenced to 195 years. David, a former state trooper, was on his way to the Indiana State Penitentiary, an all too familiar place for all the right reasons, the populace of which may have encountered him while he was still wearing his badge. For the next two years, he'd need to survive in the worst of places, a den of vengeful psychopaths. By the year 2004, David had a new team. Defense attorney Stacy Uliana and former FBI investigator Gary Dunn, who'd motioned to appeal on the grounds that the prosecution's tactic of deploying witnesses to David's infidelity would have unfairly swayed the jury emotionally in regards to whether he really killed his family. As well, the speculation of child abuse was never substantiated, yet it ultimately influenced the decision. The Court of Appeals agreed there wasn't sufficient evidence, and with the new prosecutor in the driver's seat, the defense hoped that the factual evidence would stick because David remembered Keith Henderson and Henderson remembered him. He had trained Dave in the police academy and was now presiding over prosecution. However, even he resisted re-evaluating the DNA profile. On August 10, 2004, the Indiana Court of Appeals reversed Dave's conviction, one of many hard-fought victories to come, and by January 26, 2005, had motioned to compel for DNA testing. As well, they wanted to get him out on bond in the interim awaiting his next trial, which Keith Henderson responded to with finally discovering the DNA profile inside of the office of Stan Faith, the previous prosecutor. For five years, this DNA was the centerfold of Dave's defense and it was regarded as insignificant. Yet two months later, the prosecution confirmed a match in CODIS. A match that was in the system for over three years before the Cam family murders. Charles Bonet, suggesting a clear disregard for due process on behalf of Stan Faith by neglecting evidence of such magnitude. An 11-time convicted thug with a history of violence against women and a foot fetish was roaming the streets two months prior to the murders. He was the beginning of the end. The trial would now consist of the hidden variable. A once unknown participant to the tragedy, it would ultimately shift the direction of this nightmare. They now needed to interview the one who bore the name, Backbone. From the start, Bonet illustrated he wasn't ignorant. He spoke with conviction. He had nothing to do with the murders. Investigators from both the prosecution and the defense had a go at Charles, asking him questions about his past, where he lived, about the rap sheet regarding assault on women and his affinity for feet and shoes, instances of using firearms to rob and force women into depraved situations were recounted as Bonet held eye contact, never blinking or letting on to what he really knew. He spoke properly. He spoke like someone who had been preparing for the past five years. The patriarch and former state trooper was taking the blame after all, and he had time to track the developments as they unfolded on the news. Relieved there was no mention of him or his DNA. Nevertheless, reality had caught up, and all he had left was to bluff, maintaining that And are you aware that there are possibly more than just my DNA and the DNA of an unknown female. On well, there's a lot, of, yeah, and that's that's one of the contentions that the defense has had is that for years this this DNA was not run through any database, CODIS or other databases, to try and determine as to whose identity that DNA belonged. Okay, uh, and there's other things there. There's there's a multitude of physical evidence that was found at that crime scene which hasn't been I, I or A either tested or B. Uh, tested against any, or uh, to see if there's any matches with database. Um, there, there's uh, certainly fingerprints. There's there's blood found at the scene that's uh, hasn't been identified yet. And that's the reason I ask you, and, and I ask you again, if any of that belongs to you, then that would put you at the scene. Would you agree? That's that is correct. If if something of mine was there at the scene, that means that I would have been there. Right. And that's that why, and that's why I have no problem yeah. speaking with you. That's why I had no problem meeting with you. That's why I've been forthright and honest yeah. with the prosecution team. So if you and were, and let me ask you this, and the next extension, Charles, would be, if you were at the scene, then you would have been the individual committing that crime then. That would be pretty obvious. Sure. 
Sure. A sense of arrogance lingered in his voice as he spoke to the defense investigator. And when confronted with his felonious theft of women's shoes, he would only deny having a foot fetish, as if that was beneath him. But when asked about his nickname, he would mention, My nickname's Backbone. All it means is I'm not spineless. More interrogations were conducted on the prosecution's behalf. As he tried to portray an image of innocence, it crumbled when confronted with his sweatshirt and matching DNA found at the scene, which elucidated Faith's incompetence during the first trial. Yet it seemed it was in their best interest to maintain David's involvement, regardless of where the evidence was leading. Maybe to save face, maybe out of spite, or maybe out of complete incompetence. All throughout the prosecution's interrogations, they began coaching Bonet through a scenario that worked out for both of them. To maintain that the prosecution didn't wrongfully convict Dave, and that Charles Bonet wasn't the one that pulled the trigger. Bonet's story changed to, he was at the Cam residence that night to sell David the gun he used to shoot his family. A ghost gun, wrapped in his sweatshirt. It explained why Charles' DNA was present. Only hearing three loud bangs and children yelling daddy as he walked back to his car and drove away. Finally, this was something the prosecutors and Bonet could both get behind. David's second trial began January 9th, 2006. It was as emotionally taxing as the first, this time facing an additional charge, conspiring with Charles Bonet to murder his family. Subsequently, the prosecution leaned into the evidence of child abuse on Jill, discovered by Dr. Corey who testified. What I can say as far as professionally, when asked what my professional opinion is, I can say that she has blunt trauma, that that blunt trauma is consistent with sexual abuse, but it might be consistent with something else. It's just I haven't been presented with a scenario that explains it to me. What remained was the burden of proof without a reasonable doubt that he'd abused her. At the time, Bonet's trial commenced on January 10th of the same year, in a separate court for the murder of the Cam family. His DNA was present, now he needed to defend the story he wove. All he did was sell a gun, David was the one who pulled the trigger he claimed. Yet his girlfriend Mala Singh, the female whose DNA was also present on the gray sweatshirt, testified she saw him with a gun on the night of the murders. The jury would convict him on at least Kim's murder, sending him to over 200 years in prison. While a big win for David, that dropped his conspiracy charge, his defense was prohibited from presenting the outcome of the case or the criminal history of Charles Bonnet, or the fact that he had a foot fetish. Dave's defense relied on the sweatshirt, palm print, and DNA solely while defending off accusations of child abuse and high-velocity spatter. Pushing a narrative that suggested he killed his family because Kim found out about the abuse he'd committed on Jill. The jury once again found him guilty on March 29, 2006, sentenced to life without parole. He would spend another seven years in prison before his third and final trial clinging on to the last bit of fight he had left in him. Dave's second and final appeal was filed in 2009. Yet again, there wasn't sufficiency in the state's ruling, and in June of the same year, his second conviction was reversed. This time, his defense motion for a new judge, a new prosecutor, and the exclusion of any accusations that David abused his daughter, which was granted. Likewise, the prosecution would bring Bonet to testify. The final battle was about to begin. On August 19, 2013, the third trial commenced. In a final attempt, the prosecution painted a picture of a greedy husband that killed his family for money, a payout he wouldn't see till the year 2032 from Kim's pension. It was all they had left and their back was to the wall. Except now when they brought up the eight drops of blood on David's shirt, the validity of Rob Stites was scrutinized. Under pressure, he admitted to perjury up until that point. He never had formal training in blood spatter analysis. His claims of working towards a doctorate were false, even failing out of general chemistry. The whole first trial was a facade, 13 years of toil for the realization that Dave's prosecutors were the blind following the blind. Bonet testified, retelling his ludicrous story while never blinking and occasionally staring David down, 
David didn't back down, however, making it clear that he hated Bonet and would get him for what he did. It made the jury uncomfortable. But the court proceeded. In fact, the entirety of the prosecution's case, relying on eight droplets of blood to convict someone of capital murder, became more and more ridiculous by the moment, coupled with the 11 eyewitnesses vouching for David, who kept coming back trial after trial. It brought the improbability he was in two places at once into the forefront. The jury found him not guilty on October 24, 2013. Dave, now a free man, burst into tears. Dave had only one worry now, catching up on all the lost years with the family he still has and seeking retribution. Consolidating the state, the investigators, the prosecution, and the so-called blood spatter experts in a single civil case, he sued Floyd County in 2014, eventually settling on a $450,000 payout and an apology from Rob Stites. Eight years later, in 2022, he won $4.5 million from a federal wrongful arrest civil case, an amount that helped him pay back the combined $1 million his parents, his uncles, and his friends contributed to fund his defense across the three trials. While no amount of money will bring back the family he lost, it will help him take care of himself and those important to him for the rest of his life. Frank and Janice Wren, parents to Kim and grandparents to Brad and Jill, still believe David is guilty, never truly accepting he didn't have anything to do with it. But he still keeps in touch with the jurors responsible for his freedom, forever grateful for finally bringing justice to this Cam family saga. David Cam still tears up at the thought of the family he lost, even more so at the fact that he wasn't there to protect them. At the cemetery, a tombstone depicting the three deceased Cams stood tall throughout the 13-year tragedy, and to this day, it tells a story of how the existence of evil will never truly snuff out the light of innocence and goodness. Rest in peace, Kim, Bradley, and Jill forever in the minds of those that loved you most, and the heart of the man that loved you more. <laughs>